Now we'll let Brother Ron begin. It's so clear from the title of message five and the verses that this message is on engaging in spiritual warfare. When the people of Israel were in Egypt, they were not involved in any warfare. The Lord did what was necessary to cause Pharaoh to release them. And they marched out of Egypt, as Exodus tells us, like an army. Then they spent, as we know, 40 years in the wilderness. And that was not a place of warfare either. But as soon as the people of Israel entered the land of Canaan, the war began. We know from a previous message that God promised to Abraham that his seed would inherit this land of Canaan, the promised land. Therefore, it actually belongs to God. He's the God of heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the psalmist says. And he has determined in his covenant that we are heirs and we have our portion. We will inherit it. But the enemy who has usurped this strongly refuses. So in the physical realm described in Joshua, there is a battle. But that for our purpose is all a picture it's a type of the spiritual warfare to which we must be engaged. The enemy knows that his people as slaves in Egypt are no threat to him. There is no way they can fulfill Genesis 1, 26 and 28. And he also knew that while they're in the wilderness, it should have only been there maybe eight days to go directly into the good land, but due to rebellion, disobedience, they were there 40 years. But the enemy knows if the people of Israel possess the land, they will build God's dwelling place and establish God's kingdom for him to reign on the earth. But that's a picture of the church. The enemy knows if the saints, the churches in the Lord's recovery, actually enter into the all-inclusive Christ typified by the good, the good land, God's purpose will be fulfilled spontaneously as they labor and reap a harvest again and again on this good land and enjoy the produce. They have a joyful life and they come to the feast required by God and bring the best of the produce to worship God. And the enemy knows his enemy, his time is short. For centuries he has kept his people in Egypt, the world or in wilderness, just in the natural life, the soul. But now, this is serious, he would think. God's people are actually in the all-inclusive Christ. Then the warfare breaks out. And now, I may take another 20 minutes before coming to the outline because I want to share something that has the potential of not only enabling you to defeat the enemy when he attacks you, but it will strengthen you and preserve you until the end in your Christian life and church life. 
And I'll point out after I read from verses 10 through uh, 17 of Ephesians 6. Remember, Paul is addressing the church, the body of Christ, not an individual. Finally, be empowered in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the stratagems of the devil. For our wrestling is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand having girded your loins with and having put on breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the firm foundation of the gospel of peace. Besides all these, having taken up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming darts of the evil one, and receive the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which spirit is born by the whole body. Please note that most of the armor is for defense. It's defensive armor. So we take up the whole armor of God. We our loins with truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness on our foundation of the gospel of helmet of salvation. But my burden here is on this. And receive the sword of the spirit, which spirit is the word of God. This is the unique defensive weapon. Sorry, offensive weapon. It is the only offensive weapon. Meaning, although we are covered with the armor, when the enemy attacks in this way, in that way, on the mind, on the heart, whatever it is, we are empowered to stand. We stand in the victory of Christ. We stand in the all-inclusive Christ. We will not back down. We are standing here unshakable. But there is one part of the armor, a weapon, that is offensive, that when the enemy attacks, we counterattack. And so, this is the key to the entire message. Once I can do the best I can by the Lord's supply, make this matter clear to you then we will have a way to engage every point in the outline. And so the sword is the sword of the spirit. And this sword is an offensive weapon. And then we're told which spirit is the word of God. So we have here sword, the spirit, and the word of God. And so the sword is the spirit. The word of God itself is not the sword. It's indirectly the sword. The sword is the spirit. Which spirit is the word of God? And now we come to the point that's on my heart. This is a two-edged sword. 
And what I will offer now is an experiential interpretation based on the ministry of Paul on the teaching of the apostles and opened up through the ministry of the age through Brother Nee and Brother Lee and through some portions in Brother Lee's ministry. And none of this is mere theory. So let's proceed. The enemy is subtle and clever. He doesn't know everything, but he knows a lot about the inner condition of any one of us. Any weakness, any negative feeling, any outrageous thoughts or opinions, any kind of self-seeking, these are points of attack. And when he comes to attack these points of attack, that is when we need to know how to wield the sword. But this is the crucial point. And let me give a kind of imaginary illustration, although it's based upon thousands of cases and one experience. Here is a dear sister loving the Lord, loving the Lord's recovery and the word. And her emotion, as with most sisters, is very active and very strong. And for some reason, she's been offended. And it's a fact that some are offended when there's been no offense. But whatever was said and done, it just strikes the self and the feeling in a certain way. And the person feels, I'm really offended. I'm hurt. I'm troubled by that. OK. The enemy knows this sister's condition. And he directs the evil powers, attack her right there. This is the point of attack. She's vulnerable right there. As long as she clings to this feeling, doesn't resolve it, we've got a way to deal with her. And then a part of a personal experience of mine, a real learning experience about 38 years ago. In a certain situation, because of the behavior of certain ones, I was angry. I didn't lose my temper. I didn't make a terrible display, although I spoke strongly. But after that matter was over, I had the need to inquire of the Lord. But what went on in me? Why did I feel that strong, that anger? And what I learned, and it's confirmed by Brother Lee's ministry, your anger that you had not dealt with yet. Remember Ephesians 4? Be angry, but do not sin. Let not the sun go down on your anger. Do not give ground to the devil. That if we have negative feelings and we don't know how to deal with them, the enemy knows and he can attack again and again and again and cause a very severe damage to that person spiritually and humanly and even those related to that person. And so as I was seeking the Lord the best I could at that time, I had the realization the enemy intensified the anger that I had. He knew I had the anger and wasn't dealing with it. And so he sent his forces there to intensify it. Now, here is the application of the sword of the spirit, which spirit is the word of God. I and you, we all need to use this sword 
to cut to pieces the enemy who the enemy who's attacking by the sword of the spirit which spirit is the word and it's the word we contact as spirit and life in a living way and it's the word that we testify and prophesy and pray and minister but the enemy still has the ground so first as we are contacting the Lord through word, receiving life and life supply, we are under the light and the spirit connects us of this, look at this negative feeling you have toward this person, this feeling, this anger. And then what happens is we apply the word which is the spirit that is the sword. And that sword pierces us. That's the application of the cross to us. And that anger, that jealousy, that envy, that opinion, that, e that emotion, whatever it is, is terminated. Then immediately our strength and spirit rises up. And now we can use the sword of the spirit, which spirit is the word of God, to strike the enemy who is attacking us. So he has this strat strategy. And I'm speaking in principle now that there may be scores of saints who, as they are hearing this, have at least some immediate understanding of what I'm trying to say. That this happened to me in the church and I had this feeling and this person offended me. And whatever it is and how difficult our life was until somehow we cleared it up before the Lord. But that's something we can do, you could say, uh, at our convenience, but not when we're on the battlefield, not when we are engaged in spiritual warfare, not when we are aware of this. And so the enemy knows you and I were part of the army. He attacks in so many ways, he can't get through. We hold up the helmet, the shield of faith. We claim the faith that's in the body and the fiery darts come, but they're quenched. And we have on our head the helmet of salvation. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says the helmet of the hope of salvation. Sometimes the enemy will attack your mind and say, you should give up. You'll never be an overcomer. Look at the kind of failures you have. You may do this to middle-aged persons, to older persons, to any persons. But we have a helmet. No, I will not live in despair. I will not give up. My mind is covered by the helmet of the hope of salvation. I live in Colossians 1.27. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I have the one hope with all the members of the body. So he's defeated. But then he tries another approach to aim at that part of our soul that's the target. He knows the thought is there, the self is involved there, the natural life there, the feeling. And so it is, it was a great enlightenment to me when from the Lord through the word and through Brother Lee's ministry. I began to realize, as you know, the Lord covers me to say this. I am with many others engaged in intense warfare. I can tell you it is nonstop, 24-7, in the last couple years. But the Lord in his wisdom is allowing this to train us, to develop us, not to make me or anyone a hero but to train the army. And now 
more and more I'm learning. And I have some helpers, fellow members in the body, not that they say this and that, just their life supply. I realized I need to pause, Lord, and just come to you. And I come to you in the word. And let the sword of the spirit, which is the word, touch this. Way back in 1971, in the winter, I was driving to my job. And a verse came up in me from Colossians 3. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter against them. And then the Lord showed me I'm driving. The bitterness I had toward my wife, the things she said and did that made me bitter. And I confessed that. And it was like a, a, a boil, a very painful boil. And then it was pierced by the sword. And it all flowed away. And while I'm driving, I'm, I'm composing, or the spirit is composing a new song. Dig away, dig away, dig away, dig away. I didn't realize it then. That was a kind of elementary school, spiritually speaking, experience of the sword of the spirit, which spirit is the word, to pierce something negative in your soul, your bitterness, whatever it is, and such a relief. Like many of us have felt when a boil is just broken open. What a release. But it wasn't just a release. It was an influx of life. And so we are now about to go through this outline. And we will be engaging in spiritual warfare to defeat and destroy all that is signified by the pagan tribes in the land of Canaan. But we will need to know why one aspect signified by these tribes is our natural life. To give a brief pre-outline reading summary, those pagan tribes are spiritually significant in three levels. They typify our natural life. That is Roman numeral two. I, even uh, uh, evil fallen persons, one with the evil powers in the air. And there are many in, in the world today. They're not just lawless persons. There is, a, there is an evil power working through them. And so those are the Nephilim, the giants, they signify this mixture. Of a fallen human being and the evil spirits. And then they signify the evil spirits, satanic's army in the air. And the way we can engage each of these three stages is what I try to explain, and maybe I even did a little bit, that we have the defensive armor. But we have one offensive piece, the sword. And the enemy is the one who's really killed. When we apply the sword of the spirit through the word to the, the target in ourself, at, the, at that very moment, the enemy is defeated. This is a very important experiential key. And this is all I can do right now. We need to go on. And we just are open to the Lord. Maybe by stage by stage, he will lead us on to train us in spiritual warfare. Maybe sometime in the future, there will be a conference or a training. 
but we will not speak about this in a light way because that will be at a great cost. But the Lord knows where we are, how the army is being formed. And he knows how he's rearranging the world situation, which is why he may allow a person, I wouldn't say put, but allow a person like President Biden to be there. The Lord knows what he's going to do in the world situation to prepare the way for his coming back. Because as we sang in that hymn, oh, he's coming soon. This is my feeling. He's coming soon. Oh, we want him to say within, I'm come quickly. Then what we're really waiting for is the day when we're being raptured together. He came. Okay, I'll come down back to earth now and go to Roman numeral one on the outline. But I'm not afraid of letting you see what's in my heart, and what I'm living for. What this battle for? This is part of the bride's preparation, making herself ready. So here are the qualifications. The bridegroom says, well, she must be mature. Okay, and um, she must be built up with others. This is a corporate person. And she must have much experience of life saving and reigning. And she must be beautiful, like Song of Songs 4 7. My beloved, you are altogether beautiful. There is no blemish in you. And then the Lord, oh, yeah, wait a minute now. Uh, I need a warrior wife because I'm not coming back alone. As as the triumphant one. I'm not coming back alone. I'm coming back with my warrior wife. And her wedding garment, that's another requirement, righteousnesses, the wedding garment will be her uniform. He needs this. He needs this urgently. And we're beginning a little bit, at least we're putting our toe into the water. Uh, to give us a, a feeling of this. And the Lord knows at what pace he should bring the whole recovery on. He knows. And so we just honor him as the head, as the commander in chief. This is Joshua learned. We know who's in charge of the army of God. And you are, you are today's Caleb's. And I was so happy to get an email from a family in Dublin, Ireland, and showed the picture of this little one, born a little early, but doing well. They named him Caleb. And so, uh, whether that's your actual name, I'm looking at some Caleb's on the screen. Uh, not very many live faces, but anyway, there are some figures. And we're, you're Caleb's, you're becoming a Caleb. As today's Caleb is fighting for God's interest, it is crucial for us to see a vision of the all inclusive Christ typified by the good land and to conquer the satanic chaos and triumph in the divine economy. So let's not skip over this. We need to see a vision of the all-inclusive Christ. Not just know about it, doctrine. And brothers especially, don't just take it for granted because you know something, you have a vision. Let's come to the Lord poor in spirit. Lord, I, I need a vision of you as the all-inclusive Christ typified by the good land. A, the good land, the land of Canaan, is a type of the all-inclusive Christ. The Christ who is all in all and who is everything to us. But in point B, we see right away there's warfare. The enemy has done his best 
for 2,000 years to keep the believers in ignorance concerning the all-inclusive Christ. Surely there must have been joy in the heavens in December 1962 when Brother Lee had this conference on the all-inclusive Christ. A very basic text, but it might be a good idea if we reread it. Oh, I studied that chapter on life in the good land. It was just blazing with light, ray upon ray, shining. This is how to live here. This is how to be here. This is how to work the land, to labor here. All released in that message 59 years ago. So why don't we read it as a brand new book and read it in the light of all the, the ministry, the highest ministry at the end. This is how I read the things from earlier publications. And then it's all fresh. It's just so vital. If you have a group in a home reading this, I don't know what kind of joy will be there, but it will be there. In order to possess the good land, we need to engage in spiritual warfare to conquer the satanic chaos and triumph in the divine economy. The history of the universe is a history of God's economy and Satan's chaos. And on this day, September 5th, 2021, there is more chaos in the United States than I've ever seen in my whole life. Chaos upon chaos. And it's not going to go away. It may take different forms, but this is to, to open the way for the Lord to produce overcomers. Satan is the source of chaos, and God himself is the divine economy. God is, because he is the one who plans, arranges, and dispenses, both in the Bible and in our experience, the satanic chaos always goes along with the divine economy. Which is why, and it comes to mind, I believe, from care for all of you. Often after a very uplifted semi-annual training, for instance, on that Saturday night, when we're just praising the Lord and thanking the Lord, and we are uplifted, sort of like being on the mountain of transfiguration. Then we're just wide open. But we have to leave the meeting. We have to go back to our locality. And the enemy knows our being is wide open. And so he strikes right after that. And one day, my daughter, maybe she was 17. She was a responsible driver to use the family car from time to time. And she used the car to go to a high school meeting. And it was a very living and vital high school meeting. But when some got together in the car, the atmosphere was rather reckless. Until eventually she just stopped driving and said, we need to all calm down. And she came home. And say, Daddy, I need to tell you what happened to me. What happened to me after the meeting when we were in the car? And I said, Daughter, the reason this happened is you had a very high and uplifted meeting. But you were so conscious of this. You left the meeting wide open. Then the enemy attacked. And she learned the governing principle. So time and time again, 
that the spirit's prompting at the end of it training and now nearing the end of this conference lord protect everyone the enemy is lurking we're not living in fear but you have lifted us to a rather high plane at certain times but we have to realize this is the economy we enjoy the economy but we're surrounded by chaos and so lord we guard our heart, right? We retreat into the spirit. We do not live in any kind of rapturous emotion. We just are in life and peace. Because the more we enjoy the good land, the more the enemy will fight. And so we're not afraid of that because we're fighting in the victory of Christ. Two, instead of delivering us from chaos, God wants us to be one with him to conquer the destructive satanic chaos and carry out the constructive divine economy. As we are suffering the chaos, and we have been, all of us, this pandemic, allow me to say this, was an attack of the enemy with all of his forces against the entire recovery on the earth, everywhere. How many churches still cannot be the assembly that we are? What an attack. This is my view. The Lord knows I'm willing to be correct by him and by the body. And, and uh, this wise God is ruling over it. For whatever reason, for our training, we are in the chaos. It's not going to evaporate. We need to conquer the chaos by living in the divine economy in the midst of the chaos. And so we are suffering the chaos. As we suffer, we need to stand for and live out the divine economy. We need Christ to make us unshakable. In Hebrews 12, we're told the kingdom of God is an unshakable kingdom. Those who dig out the iron and the copper for weapons and are constituted with the stones. This is part of the living and the good land. They become unshakable. And in every local church, there's a need for sisters as well as brothers that are unshakable pillars. We just stand fast no matter what happens. We're not denying we're suffering. We're not pretending. We're not heroes. But that's not all that's happening. We are living under the divine dispensing of the divine economy. And we are conquering this chaos. And even more, we are carrying out God's economy. The overcomers conquer the satanic chaos and triumph in the divine economy. How can we say this? Because Christ has conquered the satanic chaos. Just as he conquered death. But death has not been abolished yet. He has conquered chaos. It has been eliminated, hasn't been eliminated yet. So we are here in the chaos with the conquering Christ. The triumphant Christ, the overcomers suffer the chaos, but instead of being disappointed or discouraged, they are strengthened and enabled to stand for and live out the divine economy according to the truth. Some college age young people that are actually in universities depending on what department you're in, if you're in the humanities especially, 
you are probably under most of the faculty, most of the professors are liberal to the uttermost. Some of them are actually Marxist in their philosophy. And it's just a common concept that there's no such thing as truth. There's no truth. Truth is just something we construct personally or corporately. What are you talking about truth? There's no such thing as truth. That is one reason why the Lord burdened us to have a conference on the truth. And we testified the Lord's word. For this I was born. And for this I come into the world to testify concerning the truth. And then little b, we conquered the chaos by the process and consummated triune God as the all-sufficient grace. I recommend to you, and it might appear to some that I'm promoting a message I give, but that isn't the case. I'm just being transparent on your behalf. If you have the opportunity to listen to not only the first two wonderful messages from this term's ministry meeting in the training, message three talks about grace reigning, grace reigning unto eternal life. Sin abounds, grace super abounds, and grace is God coming to be our supply and our enjoyment. And so we conquer the chaos, not by our strength, not by our willpower, but by the all-sufficient grace. Now we can come to the, the uh, all that's signified by the pagan tribes. Roman number two. The various pagan tribes that occupy the land of Canaan signify different aspects of our natural life. We have to begin here. And as many of you know, for various reasons and at various times, that in the third stage of the experience of life, according to the book of that title, we are in the stage of the cross. And the first lesson there is dealing with the flesh. And then another lesson dealing with the self. And then the third is dealing with the natural constitution. And that's followed by dealing with the spirit and accepting the discipline of the Holy Spirit and being filled in spirit. But those three dealings with flesh, self, and natural constitution. They owe the way into the stage of maturity, the fourth stage. Now the life of the body flows into your awareness and you come to know the body. Then once you know the body, immediately, you also are living in ascension. You are living in, under the reigning life, and you are engaged in spiritual warfare. So this section is quite a turning point. The gods, idols of the pagan tribes, with the demons behind them, represent spiritual forces of evil. Behind our natural life are forces of evil who utilize, manipulate, and direct the aspects of our natural life to frustrate us from taking possession of the all-inclusive Christ and enjoying his riches. Now, the enemy knows you want to live in the good land. You want to experience your portion of Christ. But he also knows your natural life, your natural constitution has not been dead with 
at all or not dealt with thoroughly. And so he's behind the scene, similar to what my first part of the message was. He knows what our natural life is. He knows when we're living in our natural life. And so he utilizes our natural life. He manipulates us through our natural life. And he directs certain aspects of our natural life. Natural affection, natural intelligence, natural whatever. He just directs it in a way that's useful to him. And then we end up frustrated. It's hard to overcome this intense frustration. What do I do? I, I just have no idea what to do. So this is why we need to devote the adequate time to this. See, the pagan tribes in the land were the source of Israel's sin against God. They were instructed. Don't have anything to do with them. Don't have intermarriage with them. Don't make friends with them. They're, they're being used by the enemy. This indicates that our natural life is the source of our sins. Wasn't it the natural life that the serpent utilized with Eve? Didn't he know how to play upon her feeling and her way of thinking? And her curiosity and her desires, she was deceived. When she brought it to her husband, he wasn't deceived. So the enemy, this is what I personally think, along with some others, but I, I may be mistaken. The enemy knew Adam's weak, weak point was losing his wife. You can't, you can't live without his wife. He abdicated his headship. And the wife brought the fruit. We're not told it's an apple. That's a human invention. And so the enemy manipulated his natural affection. Maybe his fear of being alone. Then that opened the way for sin to come in. Two, in the sight of God, those who live according to the natural life are sinning continually, whether they do good or evil. Now, this may sound hard to take, sinning continuously, or you may be limiting sin to something gross. You're not robbing. You're not beating up on somebody. You're not gamble in sin city wherever you know when we know where it is it's just according to romans 323 the sin is to fall short of the glory of god to express yourself that sin that is contrary to the image in genesis 1 we are created to express god no we don't express god with glory you just express the self. We might be doing a good thing from the self, a helpful thing, but it's the natural life. And it falls short of the Lord's glory. Then we know from 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness. There's anything lawless, anything we do because it's right in our own eyes. And we feel it's fine. That some person, a person that for a period of time was among us and he's gone into another direction. And I just know this as a fact. He's, he speaks this way. Now I am my own boss. I'm my own boss. 
Jimmy's laughing. I'm your boss. Because this is natural. So sin and lawlessness. So these two verses, Romans 3. The verse I read from Romans. And also from 1 John. Contradict God's purpose in creating us. Instead of bearing his image, you express him. We're short of his glory. We express ourselves. Instead of representing his authority to deal with the end, we ourselves are lawless. That's the nature of the natural life. D, because the natural life frustrates us from possessing Christ and enjoying him, we must hate it. And as we grow in Christ, be willing to drive it out. So we want to possess Christ. After this conference, many of you already, you're seeking the Lord about this. I want to experience this. I want to live in the good land. I want to enjoy this all-inclusive Christ. Then you pray, Lord, Lord, lead me into yourself as the good land that I may enjoy you. And then you're surprised at what happens shortly after this conference. The Lord's dealing with your natural life. So what is this? I just prayed to enjoy the all-inclusive Christ. And I asked you to lead me in this. And the Lord is not speaking audibly, but his thought may be, I'm answering your prayer. I'm dealing with the hindrance in you. There's something in you that's hindering you from the very thing you are longing for. Now, are you willing to be in the light, brothers and sisters? Are you willing to be in the light, which is God himself? To show you your natural life. This will be a day of deliverance. The enemy flees. You realize, Lord, that isn't spirit. I thought that was the spirit. That's my natural life. Lord, apply the cross to it. Then we would be able to grow in Christ. E, this is an important point. From the life set of Exodus. God will not cut off our natural life, signified by the by the pagan tribes all at once because this would leave us inwardly vacant and in danger of being taken over by demons signified by the animals of the field and then in matthew 12 you may be familiar may come to your memory when i mentioned this it's like a man there's a demon there in the house, and it's driven out. But that house is empty. It's empty. And then the enemy is so clever that the house is empty. Let's go back in, and not only you go back in, we'll all go back in with you. All of us. It's dangerous to be empty. There are certain prayers that God lovingly doesn't hear. One is, Lord, save me from my natural life completely tonight. On one level, he couldn't do that. You couldn't bear it humanly. But if he did, you would be empty. The enemy will know, oh, look, look, look what we have there. And, and empty, she's empty. Let's go before she realizes what the situation is. So we need to, by the Lord's mercy, just be patient. This is a gradual thing. A number of years ago, there was a rather common speaking among very dear third and fourth term sisters. I haven't heard it lately. And they're, they're so dear when they would say this. We would uh, just ask them, would you help us in this practical way? And they're trying to be humble and they say, oh, brother, 
I'm just so natural. I'm not able to do this. I'm so natural. And I heard this again and again. So one time when I was meeting with them all in a fatherly way, I just illustrated this. Then I told them with, I believe a fatherly smile, you are so natural about saying that you're so natural. Just forget about it and contact the Lord where you are. And if we ask you to help us in this, just simply follow the leading. We're all, all in a gradual process. And so do not expect a sudden deliverance. This will make things worse than they are. Our father knows, no one referring to the father. He knows this, the need of every child. Just as wise parents are aware of where their child are in their development. Yes, you really need to take this class, but probably not that. This will be a benefit to you, whatever it is. God cuts off our natural life gradually, little by little. Well, you may not by your disposition be a gradual person. You can say, I'm not a little by little person. I'm an all or nothing person, okay? You have different kinds of dispositions, but whether you are, I want everything done immediately person, the Lord is going to wisely limit you to be a gradual little by little person. He's at peace about this. Just like parents are peaceful, their children are growing gradually. I don't know how any parents would feel if they put um, a seven-year-old boy to bed. Seven years old. Maybe seven years old, six months, and nine days old. And then mother calls, as mothers do, come, breakfast is ready. And then who comes there but a six foot five, 210? What? Not a wide receiver, but a defensive end. Who is this with a deep voice? Who is this? I'm so-and-so. I don't think they would be so joyful. They'd be shocked because it's not normal. So please spare yourself. Learn from us, from the wasted time and energy. You know, if you're going to make mistakes, you know, be original. Okay? I'm not saying make mistakes. Just recognize this is how God is leading us on gradually according to the degree of our growth in the divine life. He knows. You don't try to figure it out. He knows. So he knows what to do. Just let him be God. He's really, really good being the father God to us. The more Christ increases in us, the more he will replace our natural life. So he takes this away, replaces it with himself. F. Um, God promised to drive out the pagan tribes, but God's people had to cooperate with him by taking the initiative in destroying them. Then how do we take the initiative? It's when you yourself have the sense that what you prayed there again and again in the meeting or what you said or your feeling about it, you just with the Lord and you realize I don't think this was the spirit. This is my natural life. When you take the step, Lord, 
I want to apply the cross to this aspect of my natural life. Or when the Lord moves, he takes the first move, but you cooperate. Lord, keep going, keep going. You're touching a certain part of my being. Don't stop, Lord. I'm opening to you. Do what you need to do. And if we are passive, that equals to saying no. I've used this illustration before. If a uh, young adult brother and sister, they love the Lord, they had the feeling that the Lord might be bringing them together, and they're having a God man courtship, and uh, a genuine love is developing. The more they love the Lord, the more they love each other, the more they love each other, the more they love the Lord. So I am an old fashioned fellow, feel that brothers should be men and men should take the lead in certain things. And so they're going to propose in their way, in their time. And so here's brother A opposing to sister A. And, you know, he has the box and he has a, a middle circle with a mineral on top. You know, I don't know. Do they still kneel? I don't know. Anyway, he says, will you marry me? I believe this is from the Lord. I love you. No answer. No reply. Well, he's thinking, well, maybe she doesn't know what to say. She's overwhelmed by this. Here, will you marry me? No answer. I don't know how long you would keep this up. To me, two would be enough. Maybe one. Maybe one would be enough. And he closes the ring box and says, okay, I'll bring you home. Because passivity is the same as no. We need an active response to the Lord. Then, gee, the more Christ increases in us, the more we will be able to cooperate with God in driving out the natural life. And so we have to begin somewhere. So we're in the first stage of it. And we advance. We cooperate more. Then he deals more. Christ increases more. And then there's a cycle. This is real. Point three. This is the second significance. Because the Nephilim, a mixture of fallen angels and fallen man, dwelt in the land of Canaan, God commanded the children of Israel to take over the land and to destroy every living being there so that the human race could be cleared up. According to the divine thought, the nations in the land of Canaan had to be exterminated because they were devilish and mingled with demons. I'm just speaking in principle now. And as much as I can bear but in a very limited way to try to get some information from but actual news, but with certain of the talking heads, whether they're in entertainment or Hollywood or politicians, you sense there's something more than just a strong self there. There is an evil power behind them, that principle. That's why there are certain persons you shouldn't touch. You shouldn't touch. You see this, we saw this typology in Leviticus. But if someone is open and genuinely human, so we're just trying to illustrate not just a natural life, it's a natural life 
being fully utilized by the enemy. B, the Canaanites signify human beings who have joined themselves to the evil spirits, to the satanic power of darkness in the air. This is a minor point, so we don't need to dwell here. We just need to be faithful to what the ministry presented in the life studies. So I just needed to be faithful to all that Brother Lee presented to us. Then four, the Canaanites typify the fallen angels, the rebellious angels who follow Satan, who have become the powers, rulers, and authorities in Satan's kingdom. Okay, this is what the church must engage. And the two basic ways we engage this are an aggressive, vital preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. I say again, Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom. The United States needs the gospel of the kingdom. Not just the gospel of grace, but the gospel of the kingdom that addresses the fundamental issue of fallen humanity, rebellion against God. And we are here to bring this gospel to you, to lead you to salvation, to baptize you into the triune God and usher you into the kingdom of God expressed in the church life then we will instruct you all that the Lord has taught us for your perfection. But even more than this is the prayer ministry of the church. And I can't go into much detail because this is not a training. But even in many, many prayer meetings, there is a battle in the meeting between prayers that are out from the Lord and are unto the Lord, and prayers that are not prayers. That's Brother Nee's term used by Brother Lee. They had the form of a prayer, but it's just an expression of someone's opinion, their natural feeling. If you read the first two chapters of the book, Lessons on Prayer, you will see what I'm talking about. And so recently, I was in a Zoom prayer meeting uh, here in California. And one of the subjects was for the Lord's interest in his recovery to pray about this upcoming recall election of the governor in California. And the sense that I had as someone whose face was on Zoom with 150 plus others was that we're the church. We're not praying in a political way. We're not expressing prayers that are political, that we're of a different party or we're for a different person. We know how the enemy has been using this person and has been using the government in this state in such a destructive way. But we are engaging the evil powers behind this. This is our responsibility. Lord, now we are engaged in the warfare of prayer. Above the United States, certainly above states like New York and California, there are evil angels of the enemy in the air. We need to realize from the end of 1 Peter 3 that all these powers are subject to the ascended Christ. We are seated with this Christ on the throne in the heavenlies. Song of Songs, 
we look down upon the enemy in the air. This is where and how the church needs to pray. But many, many of the prayers so sincere were from the earth trying to reach heaven. And for a period of time, there was an attempt by some to pray prayers that originated from the heaven and were aimed through the earth. And I just realized from that experience how much we have to learn. To learn what real prayer is. And there will be a very helpful message in the upcoming Itero on prayer. Who will give it? I don't know. Otherwise, this is just kind of inspiring talk. And then week by week, it's the same. We need to engage these powers. When we preach the gospel, and we turn someone from darkness to light and from the authority of Satan to God, and they're born of God to be a child of God and enter into the kingdom of God, there is joy in the heavens. Read Luke 15. But I say even more. And this, I don't have the words to utter. The burden, the longing, the concern. All over the Lord's recovery, the prayer ministry of the church needs to be developed, perfected, uplifted. That no one is praying according to their feeling, according to their thought, according to their concept. We are one with the interceding Christ, and now one with the fighting Christ. But we're not here for this party, that party, to be the governor, this one or that one to be a senator, this one or that one to be president. But we are appealing to you. And when Daniel was praying that time for 21 days, and finally when the angel came, your prayer reached the heavens, but he had to engage in warfare to reach the earth and bring that prayer there. This is the matter of the spiritual warfare of the church I'm most burdened for. Now we'll read and we'll be done within five minutes. It'll be a good half hour for the next part of the meeting. In the typology of the Old Testament, Canaan has two aspects. On the positive side, Canaan is a land of riches, typifies the all-inclusive Christ with his unsearchable riches. On the negative side, it signifies the aerial part, the heavenly part of the dark kingdom of Satan. So when we're in the good land, we're in Christ, and simultaneously, we're engaged in the spiritual warfare. The typology is so helpful. It typifies the all-inclusive Christ. It signifies the aerial part, the heavenly part of the kingdom of Satan. And so we're just not going to be sowing and reaping and having feasts and dinners so peacefully and joyfully. We're on a battlefield. During the last few months of Brother Lee's time on earth, when he asked certain brothers to be available every morning, Monday through Friday, that when he would call them, they would come to his house for whatever reason. And usually it was three times a week. And one time, he wanted us to pray. He trained us to pray the prayers of warfare. And he illustrated and he testified. He said, during the night, I wrestled with the enemy nose to nose. Ephesians 6 says, we're wrestling. We're not firing rockets to an enemy far away. 
When I was a little boy, I did some wrestling, but I wasn't interested in that. I tried to play tennis. But that is as close a contact as you can have with your opponent. We are wrestling. And Brother Lee had each one of us pray such a prayer. We'll never forget that session. This is the beginning of our learning. Brothers, you need to know how to pray. Prayers of warfare. And we all need to learn to do this. Be, but not individually. We just look to the Lord in his way and time. He'll have a way to perfect us. What he's looking for is that we are wide open. We are responsive. We recognize the need. We are ready to move. Brothers, just set the time. Make the arrangement according to God. We'll be there. We will give ourselves there. There needs to be such a spirit. And then we just bring everything to the source. God, our Father. We don't do anything out of excitement. We don't do anything because thousands of people want us to do it. We must live under the throne and follow the Lord's directions. But I believe he's going to train his warrior bride. We're going to be part of her. As the ruler of this world and as the ruler of the authority of the air, Satan has his authority and his angels who are his subordinates as principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world. Hence, he has his kingdom, the authority of darkness. And we are the, the practicality and reality of the kingdom of God on the earth, engaged in warfare with Satan's kingdom. Let it be. Because our commander in chief has already won the victory. He fought for victory. We fight from victory. We fight in victory. We stand firm with the armor on. And we are learning how to use the sword of the spirit. We will not spare ourselves. And we will not spare you. And we'll just, having done all, the stand. And maybe that's when, who knows, we're making this firm stand. And I just love to say this because of the hope. We're making this firm stand and we find out we're not standing anymore. We're ascending. This is the rapture of the first fruits. We're not, I'm not in Anaheim anymore. You're not in Atlanta or Miami anymore or Boston. We're before the throne. This is, it has to happen. It's the word of God. It has to happen. Why not us? Why not we be included? Maybe we really are nearing to the end. And then the last point, the church must be such a corporate warrior fighting against Satan's aerial forces so that God's people may gain more of Christ for the building up of the body of Christ, establishing and spreading the kingdom of God so that Christ can come back to inherit the earth. Allow me to end by making this request as a suggestion. When you meet in your prophesying groups, I sincerely request that you would all read together Roman numeral four point D. This is just a summary of what this spiritual warfare will do. And we are on our way to being formed into such an army. What a privilege and what a blessing and what a victorious Christ is our Christ. So this is the last of my live time with you. You'll see recorded message tomorrow. 
I'm so thankful for this hybrid conference that I could be with you. Uh, I'm so thankful, so happy. Okay, your turn, your time. See you soon.